this is a real story. Young man, 24 years old, was working as a tree surgeon. And he was on the ground. He wasn't the guy up on the tree there. But he got hit in the head with a branch. And it wasn't a trunk like that. I just figured I'd put a dramatic picture up there. But he got hit in the head with a branch. And he came rolling in to the emergency department. Now, EMS got there. And they couldn't intubate him because his jaw was clenched. And they bagged him and they put two nasal airways in and they rolled him through the door. Um, and his GCS was roughly six. And as you're standing there in the emergency department with this really sick patient coming through, what are you thinking? I'm thinking, here's a guy, traumatic brain injury. I don't know what's going on with the rest of him but something bad is going on because his GCS is six and they couldn't intubate him. So we're in trouble here. We know that this patient has TBI. We don't know if he's got a subdural, an epidural, a parenchymal bleed, a skull fracture, a diffuse axonal injury, subarachnoid hemorrhage or intraventricular hemorrhage, but it doesn't matter. All of these entities are traumatic brain injury. And all you know is that this guy is a GCS and he got hit on the head with the tree branch. So what we're going to go through is best practices. And when I say new guidelines from the traumatic brain, the brain trauma foundation, they're kind of new because they haven't been updated since 2000 and they updated them in about 2012, I think. So they're kind of new. But the one thing about guidelines for traumatic brain injury is that they're really tough to make guidelines. Because as you saw, there's multiple different types of traumatic brain injury. We don't know what's going on. And to study TBI is very difficult. It's heterogeneous. We don't have great tools to know exactly what to do with each and every one. So we have broad guidelines. And we'll go through those. So you know that trouble is brewing because this guy doesn't have a good mental status and he's been hit in the head. But you really don't know exactly what's going on, although you'd like to. When we practice pre-hospital or emergency medicine, we practice with both sides of our brain. And that means analytic and intuitive. The analytic is on the brain side the intuitive is on the heart side, but they both kind of live in the brain. And here's how that works. If you have somebody coming into the emergency department that says, I have chest pain, and the chest pain lasts for 20 seconds, and it comes and goes multiple times a day, it has nothing to do with exertion. I've had it for years, but I'm worried because I have this chest pain. You're not gonna work this person up. You're not gonna admit him for the chest pain, ACS, rule out, et cetera, because intuitively, you know that that's a really bad story for chest pain. It doesn't fit with any of the criteria for a, a, you know, acute coronary syndrome. So you're gonna get an EKG probably, you're gonna talk to them and figure out what else is going on. That's the intuitive side. If you worked that patient up with the analytic side of your brain, you would get an EKG, you would get a troponin or two or maybe three, you might, get the ultrasound and do an echo. You're gonna maybe admit the patient because, oh, it's chest pain, we, we have to figure this out. That's analytical. You're getting every single piece of data that you can. Well, we can't work up every complaint in the full analytic fashion because patients would be lined up outside the door. Oh, wait a minute, they already are lined up outside the door, aren't they? I know they are in my emergency department, but anyway, this is, the gist of TBI is you know something bad is going on, but you don't know exactly what's going on. So you, you, you don't know exactly how to treat it yet, but you do have some broad brush strokes. So we're using the intuitive part of our brain. We know that this patient has elevated intracranial pressure, almost certainly. Now I will tell you that this patient, although he has a 
poor GCS. He had no trauma below the neck. There's a C collar. They were bagging him. It's got two nasal airways and nothing below the neck. So what do you need to know and what is the first thing and the most important thing you need to think about whether you're pre-hospital or emergency medicine about traumatic brain injury? It's this, no hypotension. Hypotension is probably the worst thing for traumatic brain injury. Chesnut told us years ago that one single blood pressure less than 90 millimeters mercury is associated with a really significant increase in mortality. And that's an old study. We have much better studies now. This is a study from Dan Spade out in Arizona where they do some amazing EMS um, research. What they did was they took patients from the field when they were determined to have moderate to severe TBI, they started measuring their blood pressure. And they measured it every five to 15 minutes. And they kept measuring that right through the emergency department visit. And what they showed prospectively was that every, every five millimeters of mercury, higher blood pressure that those TBI patients had, they did better, all the way up to 135. So we knew from Chesnut that 90 was a cutoff. Now we're starting to see that we need to have that blood pressure even higher. So think about that when you see the TBI patient, I want my blood pressure higher. Now let me ask you a question, and you may not answer it because of our, our video here, but I told you that this patient had nothing below the neck. His belly was soft, non-tender. His pelvis was stable. He did a squeeze. There was no instability of the pelvic ring. His chest wall, no trauma, no signs of trauma, and lung sounds are clear. What if he actually had some blood in the belly? What if I told you that this patient had a tender abdomen especially in the left upper quadrant, and he showed fluid with ultrasound, with the FAST. Then you would be dealing with not only a patient with traumatic brain injury, but a patient with intra-abdominal bleeding. That kind of changes the picture with respect to blood pressure. So with isolated TBI, I want that blood pressure to be high. I want it to be greater than, we'll see, greater than 100, greater than 110. But if you have intra-abdominal bleeding or intra-thoracic bleeding, now you're worried about that bleed and you really don't want to push it. Because we know from trauma data from Texas that if you push fluid pre-hospitally, or you get that blood pressure as high as you can, the patient bleeds more. So if you, are, you have the unfortunate patient who has intra-abdominal bleeding and traumatic brain injury, you're walking a fine line and you wanna keep that blood pressure somewhere around 90 to 100. There's no great guidelines for that. But that's not what we have here. Let's go back to our story. We have a guy with isolated TBI. We know that he doesn't have anything else going on. He's just got traumatic brain injury. So we want that blood pressure to be higher. Now, these are blood pressure targets for all of the neuro disasters that we see in the emergency department. With hemorrhagic stroke, that's the intraparenchymal bleed, we want it to be less than 180 and maybe less than 160, maybe less than 140. That's another talk for another day. If you have subarachnoid hemorrhage, you want it to be less than 140 and you want to get it down quickly. Now the guidelines would say less than 160, but most of us operate in the less than 140. With ischemic stroke, you know you want it to be less than 185, but you want it to be higher. And today we're talking about traumatic brain injury. You want it to be greater than 100. And with the new guidelines, greater than 100 is for patients from the age of 50 to 69. This guy is less than 50 years old, so we want it actually to be greater than 110. 
And that's because we know that the traumatic brain injured patient is trying to keep those arteries open. The bleed is going on and it's causing a lesion that compresses the brain. Because remember, the skull is, is, a, is a hard surface. It's, it's only going to allow so much swelling. And with a young brain, you don't have much space to go. So when that lesion, that bleed happens, whatever it is, and the edema that's associated with it, it starts compressing on all the arteries. And it's trying to close those arteries. So the brain itself is trying to keep its blood pressure up so that to keep those arteries open, so as not to add stroke to the problem of traumatic brain injury. So that's the very first thing we wanna know. Keep that blood pressure up. If you're in the field, if you're in the ED, I don't care where you are, keep it up. Start some fluid, get that blood pressure up. So the next thing we wanna think about is that we're optimizing cerebral perfusion pressure. And this is a little bit of why we want to keep the blood pressure up. We know that this formula is true. Cerebral perfusion pressure is that pressure that the brain has to keep the arteries open. The definition is mean arterial pressure minus ICP. Now, some people ask, why does the definition go by mean arterial pressure when the literature goes by systolic blood pressure. And my answer to that is really when we do studies, especially when we're in the field or in the emergency department, we're not really usually measuring mean arterial pressure. You may have a calculated blood pressure on your monitor and it may be calculating the map for you, but typically we measure systolic blood pressure and that's how the studies were done. But it should correlate to the mean arterial pressure and the ICP. So if your mean arterial pressure is higher than your ICP, you're gonna have a positive CPP. You want your, your CPP to be around 50 or 60 to keep those arteries open. But I hope you're asking yourself, how on earth are we supposed to know what the ICP is? We're standing in the emergency, emergency department in the trauma bay and this guy just rolled in. I have no idea what his ICP is because I don't have any way to measure it. And you're exactly right. This is where your intuition comes in. You know that his GCS is six. You know that he got hit on the head. You know he's a traumatic brain injury patient. So you know you wanna keep your pressure higher. And we have the guideline to go by, which is greater than 100 or greater than 110 for the younger or the older folks. So that's the first thing. 60 to 70 is what you want to have your cerebral perfusion pressure at. So you're thinking, let's get this guy intubated. He doesn't have a protected airway. And that is the first thing that we need to do is protect his airway. A couple of things is, a couple of things are, um, keep that head of the bed up 30 to 45 degrees. With anybody who has any kind of a brain injury, whether it's a bleed, a spontaneous bleed, a stroke, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, or TBI, they will do better with the head of the bed up. It helps to have venous flow out from the brain, and it helps decrease the ICP that's probably going on. So head of the bed up before, during, and after your intubation, if possible. If you have an obese patient, keeping the head of the bed up during intubation will also help your, your intubation practice because you're taking a lot of that weight off of the thoracic cavity. You're allowing the body's habitus to drift downward with gravity and it actually makes the airway more accessible. So what are we gonna use for RSI? Let's talk first about sedation. You could use propofol. In some places they use thiopental. Midazolam is an option. All of these are options, but the bad thing about all of these is that they're going to drop blood pressure. So we're not crazy about these for traumatic brain injury. Etomidate is our favorite, right? We've been using this for years. It's the most blood pressure neutral sedating agent, and that's why we use it 
And it's a very nice agent. The nurses know how to use it. We're all familiar with it. We know how to dose it. So Tomidate is a great agent. It won't drop the blood pressure unless you give too much. Well, wait a minute. What about ketamine? Ketamine is very popular right now. Lots of people using it for many different reasons. It's a great agent for RSI. Now we used to say with ketamine, it would increase the blood pressure, it would increase the ICP. That was the prevailing theory. But we went back and looked at those studies and we realized that the way ketamine works is by increasing the heart rate and the blood pressure. And it's a dissociative agent. So if you're increasing heart rate and blood pressure, what's happening with your cerebral perfusion pressure? It's going up. So in isolated TBI, ketamine is a good agent and we can now use it because we're helping cerebral perfusion pressure. But let me say this, let's go back to the, to the alternate example I gave you before. If you have somebody who's got TBI and blood in the belly, and you're trying to maintain that blood pressure somewhere around 90 or 100, ketamine might not be the agent because again, it's going to increase blood pressure. And if you've got a, a bleeding spleen or a liver, you don't want to push that blood pressure too high. So you have to be thoughtful about what agent you're using. Atomidate is a safe agent for each case, but with TBI, if you're working hard on that blood pressure, ketamine would be a good choice. Remember, we're keeping the cerebral perfusion pressure up by helping the MAP to stay up and overcome the ICP. What about lidocaine? Some of you in the room probably remember that we used to pre-treat with lidocaine when we intubated. Well, we're not doing that anymore. What we used to think was that pre-treating with lidocaine three minutes before the intubation would help mitigate increase in ICP. But when we went back and looked at the studies, that, that was really looking at patients who were already intubated and getting suctioned in the ICU. It wasn't our RSI patients for TBI. So lidocaine is out. We don't use lidocaine pretreatment anymore because actually lidocaine can drop blood pressure in RSI. Well, what about fentanyl? Fentanyl is actually a good agent for a couple of reasons. First of all, there are studies that use remifentanyl, which is a very short acting fentanyl, that have shown that they decrease the incidence of myoclonus if you use Atomidate. I don't know if any of you has seen myoclonus when you use Atomidate for, for sedation. It looks like a seizure and it can be pretty scary. Um, fentanyl has been shown, remifentanyl has been shown to mitigate that. But the other thing that fentanyl does is it treats pain. Anybody with TBI pain. And when you decrease pain, now you're decreasing the cerebral metabolic rate and helping to decrease ICP. So lidocaine's out, fentanyl's in. What about our paralytics? Now, there's arguments for both the non-depolarizing and depolarizing agents, and I'll go through both of them. Some people love succinylcholine for a couple of reasons. One is it's very rapid on onset, and if you don't get the tube, the thinking is, well, the succinylcholine will wear off and then the patient will be breathing on his own again. There's a downside to succinylcholine. It's rare, but you can have rare um, incidents of cardiac arrest or arrhythmias. And the other downside is when you're intubating this difficult to intubate patient, if the succinylcholine wears off and your first attempt wasn't successful, now you have to re-paralyze him for a second attempt. And probably you're gonna use something different because if you redose succinylcholine, you run the risk of bradycardia. And we don't really like that in our traumatic brain injured patients. So shifting gears to rocuronium or vecuronium, these are longer acting agents. They're non-depolarizing. And 
Rock uranium really is a favorite. It's what we use. It's what I like. And the reason is, if you dose rock uranium at 1.6 mg per kg, you're going to get as fast onset as succinylcholine. Now, rock uranium will last. It'll last about an hour anyway. So if you miss the first attempt, now you're not messing with redosing or trying to paralyze your patient with another agent. You're just getting ready for your second attempt and you can focus on the airway. That's probably the best reason why I prefer rock uranium or vecuronium. I've used both and it depends on what you have access to. Now, the downside to rock uranium is it does last for an hour and you lose the exam. So you have to be prepared to lose the exam when you use a longer acting agent. And for that reason, and for multiple reasons, you want to make sure that you do a neuro exam before you intubate the patient. So I prefer rock uranium. Some prefer succinylcholine. It's up to you uh, to make that decision. And um, I bet through your residency, you will use both at one time or another, and you'll decide what your preference is by the time you graduate. When you put the blade into the molecular, you're going to cause an increase in ICP. We know that. You increase blood pressure, you increase ICP. It's, a, it's an action that we anticipate. And with TBI, that's really not such a problem. But when you're intubating any of the neurodisaster patients, you are going to be thinking about where exactly do you want your blood pressure to be? And if it goes up when you want it to stay down, or it goes down when you want it to stay up, you want to be prepared for that. Because anything that we cause with regard to blood pressure, we want to fix. And we want to fix really right away. We don't want to wait. And the reason for that is the brain doesn't have a whole lot of space within the skull. And if it doesn't have compliance because we've got a bleed or we've got edema or we've got both, then you can cause herniation, you can cause pressure, you could cause damage. And you really want to keep that blood pressure where you want it to be. And I say where you want it to be because I showed you before, each different neuro disaster has specific different targets. So how am I going to do that? How am I going to keep the blood pressure where I want it to be? First off, if you have the opportunity, hydrate the patient. And this patient, young, male, he doesn't have congestive heart failure. He didn't have any comorbidities. EMS started fluid on him right away. That was the best thing to do. It keeps blood pressure up. And when you have a patient who's properly hydrated, they're going to have less lability with their blood pressure when you intubate them and you use your RSI agents. So keep that patient hydrated if you have time to do it. And that's where EMS is really, really helpful. Second is keep looking at your blood pressure in real time. If you had the opportunity to put an arterial line in, it's much better because now you're going to see exactly where your blood pressure is without cycling that cuff every five minutes. And the third is a little trick that I learned from my anesthesia colleagues. What they do is they start an esmolol infusion. Hook it up, prime the, the line, prime the pump, get it attached to the IV, and they either just have it right there ready to go or they start a very low dose because that is something that they can use to drop blood pressure if it goes too high. Now that's mostly going to be with patients who you're worried about blood pressure going up like the intracerebral hemorrhage or the subarachnoid hemorrhage. In TBI, we don't really need to think about that because when that blood pressure goes up, what it's saying to me is that brain is trying to protect itself. It's trying to keep the arteries open. So I don't get too excited about high blood pressure in TBI. 180, I'm okay with it. 200, 210, now I start thinking, well, that's a little bit high. And the first thing I do in order to bring that blood pressure down 
is treat the pain. So I'm going to give a dose, maybe 50 mics of fentanyl, and I'm even going to start a fentanyl infusion. When I'm done intubating this patient, because I use a long acting agent, I want to be very careful to let the nurses know this patient has a long acting paralytic. They're not going to show us that they're waking up. We need to sedate them right away. So I usually hang a propofol drip because it's easy on, easy off. And I add a fentanyl drip at a low dose. When you have fentanyl and propofol, both of those can be turned off quickly to do a neuro exam if you need to. And both of those synergistically decrease the amount of the other one. So you'll use less propofol and less fentanyl if you use them together. And it's pretty much what we run our patients on in the neuro ICU. So when you're intubating, one of the things that I used to have an issue with is I would be in the ICU and we'd be intubating a patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage or something, and the blood pressure would shoot up or it would drop down. And I would ask the nurse, can you get me whatever agent it is, whether it's phenylephrine to bring the blood pressure back up, um, or a, you know, a dose of propofol to bring it down or levetolol or something. And they'd say, okay. And they'd run out to the Pixis and they'd put the patient's name in and they'd say, oh, I'm going to have to override this. And it takes them five minutes to get that out of the Pixis. Then they come back in and they have to draw it up and they have to put it on the pump or whatever they're doing. And that takes forever. So when I'm intubating a patient, if I have the opportunity, I'm using push dose agents. Now, there's arguments for and against push dose agents in emergency medicine. Some people say we shouldn't be using them because we don't do this all the time. Guess who says that? It's anesthesia. And other people say, you know what? If you caused a problem with the blood pressure, you need to fix it. And what you need to do with push dose agents is have it set up beforehand. Know what you're going to use, know the dosing, know how to put that into a syringe label the syringe and um, be ready to use it. So you have to think about this beforehand and in your program, have it set up and, and know what the doses are. So now you've intubated the patient and you're putting them on the ventilator. How are you gonna, how are you gonna adjust the ventilator? Should we hyperventilate this patient? When I was a paramedic and that was in the early, 90s, every patient that we had who was TBI, we were told to hyperventilate. The reason being, when you hyperventilate, you're blowing off CO2, you're vasoconstricting, and you're buying yourself some space in the skull. But we learned soon after that, that hyperventilation isn't always the best thing. So if you look at this, when you, when you hyperventilate, it's very true that you're blowing off CO2 and you're vasoconstricting. And if your blood vessels, your cerebral arteries are dilated, they're going to take up a lot of space. And remember, this you don't have a whole lot of space. I've got presumably a bleed, and he's probably got some edema to go off along with that. So if the blood vessels are dilated, going to take up space and you could run into a case where you have some pending herniation. And when you do hyperventilate, that means blowing the PCO2 down to 25 or 30. Yeah, you buy yourself some space, you buy yourself some time. But look over on the right, right side of the screen. The brain sees the pH going up and the brain's pretty smart and it says, I need to fix that. So with idiosmols, the brain does fix that and it brings the pH down. And when the pH comes down, those blood vessels dilate again. So now you've got vasodilation in reaction to the brain fixing its pH. And now you've got a problem. And that vasodilation can last an hour or up to 24 hours. So we don't want to hyperventilate unless we're at the end of the line, we've done everything we can for ICP and or we're heading to the operating room to either put in a ventriculostomy or if somebody's coming to the ED to put in a ventriculostomy or if you go into the operating room to do a craniectomy. 
then you can have as much vasodilation as you want because you have space to, to, to balloon out. And you have, even with a ventriculostomy, you have something like a pop-off valve to get rid of CSF. So hyperventilation is not the standard early on. The other thing we know about hyperventilation is that in the first 24 hours of a brain injury, the brain is auto-regulating and it's very sensitive. So you can hyperventilate and actually vasoconstrict so much that it can cause stroke. So we're very, very careful about hyperventilation. And we don't use it until and unless, it's kind of like the kitchen sink, unless we're heading to the OR. So this being a true story, um, I was working in the neuro ICU and this patient got intubated in the ED. And when he was intubated, during the intubation process, he bradied. His heart rate went to 30 and his blood pressure went up. So you should be thinking now, that's Cushing's. I'm worried. I'm very worried about this patient. I'm worried because when a TBI patient has hypertension and bradycardia, that's a classic sign for increasing ICP, swelling, maybe even herniation. So they got into the scanner and this is what they saw. He had a subdural hemorrhage with 10 millimeters wide and you can see the midline shift was 1.3 centimeters and it's completely obliterated the left lateral ventricle. Remember this is a young man with a young brain that's taking up most of the space in the skull. Before they went to CT though, they gave him a dose of mannitol. So when we talk about subdural hemorrhage, that subdural really doesn't look that big, does it? But what we don't see on this CAT scan is the edema that's associated with it. We see evidence of it because it's pushing that lateral ventricle and closing it down. We see evidence of it because you've got 1.3 centimeters of shift for that kind of small and unimpressive 10 millimeter subdural hemorrhage. Now you may have seen subdural hemorrhages that are bigger than that without shift, like this one. This is an MRI, but this is a chronic subdural hemorrhage. You may see chronic subdural hemorrhage with alcoholics or elderly because they can get a subdural and tolerate it. Because look at how much more space they have in that brain. And there's absolutely no midline shift. But when you have a young man with a TBI and a GCS of six and um, he Brady's down in the intubating process, boy, your intuition is saying, we have a lot of trouble. We've got a very high ICP, probably. We've got something going on in there. So what are the next things we need to do? Well, if the patient's on any anticoagulation, whether it's a vitamin K antagonist or a, a novel oral anticoagulant or an antiplatelet, you want to reverse that. And you're saying, well, wait a minute, what about the PATCH trial? The PATCH trial told us don't reverse antiplatelets. That's true, but the PATCH trial looked at spontaneous intracerebral hemorrhage. It didn't look at TBI, it didn't look at subarachnoid hemorrhage. So unless you have a spontaneous bleed, like a hypertensive spontaneous bleed, anybody else who has agents on board, they need to be reversed. What about seizure prophylaxis? So people ask, well, how do I know if the patient's seizing? First of all, a clinical seizure, you will see it. You know what a clinical seizure looks like. But with this patient who's got a GCS of six and he's not interacting and he's not following commands, until proven otherwise, he's seizing. Subclinical seizures, if you go up to any ICU, you walk around, 20% of patients will have subclinical seizures going on. We won't know that until we get the EEG hooked up. But fortunately, with the Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines, they tell us anybody with moderate to severe TBI is likely seizing. They will get anti-epileptics for seven days. 
So all you need to do is start something. It can be phenytoin, it can be phosphenytoin, it can be levetiracetam, it doesn't matter. Most people are choosing levetiracetam these days, probably because it's easy. And it's also easy in the ICU. We don't need to follow levels. And it's very well tolerated by most people. We can see there's some studies that looked at um, mental status or irritability or mood disorders later down the line with Keppra, but it really isn't as significant as all that. So just use whatever you have and give them a dose, load them. What about osmotics? I told you that this patient got mannitol. He got mannitol right away because they were very concerned when that heart rate dropped and the blood pressure went up. We have two options. We've got sugar, we've got salt. The sugar is mannitol. The salt is hypertonic saline. They both work and there's a lot of studies out there looking at which one is better. And I'll tell you, we're never going to know which one is better because they're both cheap, they're both easy to use, and they both work. Now, there's a couple of differences that you need to think about. With mannitol, when you give it, it's a diuretic. So you're going to need to make sure that your patient's getting fluid alongside the mannitol so that they don't drop their blood pressure and they don't dehydrate. Um, mannitol is easy to use. It has to be um, has to be stored well, and um, nurses know how to dose it. We've been using it for ages. So if that's what you're using, go ahead and use it. The, the thing to think about though is that blood pressure dropping. Now hypertonic saline, what about that? It's kind of the new kid on the block. It's not really that new, but we've started thinking more about it. The hypertonic saline comes in different concentrations. You can get one and a half percent, three percent, seven and a half percent, and even what we call a bullet of 23 percent hypertonic saline. Now the most simple to use is the 3%. A 250 bag, 250 cc bag of 3%, hang it. You can give it through a peripheral line. Um, with seven or 23%, you really should have a central line because if hypertonic saline extravagates, extravasates, it's toxic to the tissue. So you wanna be careful with that. Not to say that I haven't given 23% through a nice AC line. I have, and we do. Because if somebody's ICP is, is elevated, I'm worried about that brain, and I'm gonna use the line that I have, as long as it's flowing well. But hypertonic saline has a benefit in that it's a volume expander. It's not gonna cause the diuresis that mannitol does. So with TBI, it's a great option, because you're keeping the blood pressure up, your volume expanding, and they both work very quickly. If you, had, if you had a ventriculostomy in, and you gave a dose of 23% hypertonic saline, you will see the ICP come down almost immediately. And the same with mannitol. They both work great. Well, what about using both of them? There's no reason not to use both mannitol and hypertonic saline if you're really worried. All right, what about that ventriculostomy? Who needs a ventriculostomy? Well, we have a guideline for that too. Anybody with a salvageable TBI, and that's after resuscitation, they have a GCS of three to eight and an abnormal CT. That's our patient right now, right? He's got a GCS of six. We've given him some fluid. We've given him some mannitol and his CT looks bad. He's got a 60% chance of having increased ICP. Now, what if the CT, the, the CT was normal, but he still had a bad looking exam, or his blood pressure was less than 90, or he was posturing, or anybody over 40, those patients also have a significant risk of increased ICP. So by these criteria, you get a bad TBI that rolls through the door, they're going to benefit from a ventriculostomy in two ways. First of all, now you're going to know what your ICP is, so you can more accurately target your blood pressure. You can know what's going on. But secondly, you're going to be able to drain CSF and bring that ICP down. 
So if you have the ability to get neurosurgery down into the emergency department and put a ventriculostomy in, that's great. And it's going to be helpful. If not, they'll have to wait until they get either to the OR or up to the ICU to get that. But it's helpful to know about that when you're calling neurosurgery saying, I've got a 24 year old guy who's got a 10 millimeter subdural hemorrhage with 1.3 centimeters of shift and his GCS is six. I think you might want to come down with your ventriculostomy kit. Who knows? They may, they may not. What about hypothermia? We know that targeted hypothermia decreases ICP. That's been shown. We know that targeted temperature management improves outcome for post-cardiac arrest patient. That's been shown too. And it seems intuitive that if we cool TBI patients, it'll bring down ICP and they would have a better outcome. But we have not proven that yet. The polar study in New Zealand and the Eurotherm trial both looked at this in slightly different ways. And they looked at TBI patients who were getting a lot of things done and they cooled them and they could not show improved outcome. So while it's a nice idea, we haven't proven that it works. We do know though that fever is bad. Any brain disaster, any brain injury that you have, fever is bad. Fever increases the cerebral metabolic rate and it leads to a worse outcome, whatever it is, whether it's subarachnoid, ischemic stroke, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage or TBI. If your patient has a fever and you have the ability to give them something like acetaminophen, bring that down, we should do that. And we keep a very close eye on temperature up in the ICU. So here's our patient. He went, he got mannitol. He got an AED. He, he got probably at that time, he was probably getting a dose of Keppra. And now he's in the CT and you're looking at this image. And the emergency physician said, we should, we should call neurosurgery and get to the OR. But the trauma surgeons decided that they would go to the surgical ICU. So they went up to the surgical ICU with this patient. And surgical ICU is right next door to the neuro ICU where I was working. And the uh, patient was up there. And in a short amount of time, they called me and they said, can you come over here and help us with this patient? Because what happened was he got up to the ICU and his blood pressure was going up. 180. 190. So somebody ran to get the nicardipine to bring the blood pressure down. Now I'll tell you, there's a very strong propensity for people to want to bring blood pressure down. This is where emergency medicine is so strong, so important, and so integral to patient outcome. Because you know that TBI, the patient wants to have that high blood pressure. So they brought me over and I said, no, no, don't hang the nicardipine. Let's do a few other things first. Now, here's a list of all the things you can do if you know that your patient's ICP is up and going up. Now remember, this patient does not have a ventriculostomy yet. So we don't know what his ICP is, but we know his blood pressure is going up. And they noticed that he had a poor exam. So head of the bed up, we talked about that analgesia, start a fentanyl drip, sedation, make sure he's sedated properly, hyperventilation, that's an option, but not until you know you're going to have either a pop-off valve or going to the OR. Osmotics have been given. We could give another dose. Ventriculostomy is what he needs. And these are the things up on the top that we can do either pre-hospital or in the emergency department. This is where we make a difference. When you get into the ICU, that's where we're going to probably do a ventriculostomy. We may use vasoactives. So in our TBI patients, if we've done everything else, I might start a phenylephrine infusion to push the blood pressure up because I want to keep those vessels open. We might give a paralytic. And this is one thing that I did with this patient is we gave him 10 milligrams of vecuronium. That's what we were using at the time. So Tenevec paralyzes the whole body and it decreases ICP. 
We called neurosurgery and said, this patient's not doing well. His blood pressure is going up. I just paralyzed him. We're heading to the CT. They said, that's good. We'll meet you in the OR. And we talked a little bit about therapeutic hypothermia. One of the other things that we can do sort of at the end of the line is a phenobarbital burst suppression. What this means is that we're going we're gonna to load the patient with a barbiturate and we're going to watch on EEG until we suppress the brain waves that are causing trouble. There's some downsides with that. When you do a phenobarbital burst suppression, you're going to also increase the risk of cardiac problems, of infectious problems, of gut motility. So it's really the end of the line. And it's, it's nothing you would think about in the emergency department. I just put that up there to know what we're doing up in the ICU. But this guy, he had all the head of bed up, analgesia, sedation. We did not hyperventilate. But when we started going to the OR, that's when we started hyperventilating because we were buying ourselves some time. We gave him a dose of vecuronium and we went to, this, to the CAT scan. And then he went to the OR to get a craniectomy. And this is his brain after the craniectomy. And look how nice it looks. You can see the lateral ventricles, you can see the sulci and the gyri, and he's got room to swell. Clearly, that subdural hemorrhage wasn't the only thing causing him problems. He had some edema to go along with it. Now this guy actually did quite well. He got out of the hospital in about a month or two, and he went to rehab. Because he was young and healthy, um, he did really well. Typically, patients who get the craniectomy will get that put back in about three months, depending on how long it takes for the brain to come back to its normal size. So they'll leave the hospital with a helmet and go to rehab. So what about craniectomy? Now, we don't do craniectomy for just anybody. There's a couple of studies that looked at this. One of them is the DECRA study. The other one is Rescue ICP. What DECRA looked at was traumatic brain injury patients who had all of these. They had sedation, they had uh, the vent, they had osmotics, paralysis, they had a ventriculostomy, and then they did a craniectomy. And they tried to show that taking the skull off improved outcome, and they didn't show that. There were some issues with how the study was, was done. They, they, and so rescue ICP folks came in and said, let's do that study and let's do it better. And they did. They had two parts. They had head of bed up, ventilation, sedation, analgesia, paralysis. They were monitoring everything. And then the second phase was get ventriculostomy, inotropes, osmotics, cooling them. And only after that did they say, okay, let's take the skull off. And rescue ICP showed improved outcome. But let's look a little bit at the science here. When you measure outcome for brain injured patients, you're using the Glasgow Outcome Scale. And if you look on the left hand side, the scale from one to eight, from one to four is typically what we call a poor outcome. From five to eight is a good outcome. What Rescue ICP did is if you go to the right side, they said, well, we're going to count four as a good outcome. So one through three is a bad outcome and four through eight is a good outcome. And by doing that, they shifted the curve. And critics say, listen, if you had used the conventional dichotomy, there would be no improved outcome with your study. So there's... There's not, there's not a really solidly good answer to who should get a craniectomy. In younger people, it's more likely that they will. In older folks, what we know is that you can do a craniectomy and you will save somebody's life, but you're not going to affect their outcome. They're not going to get better and they're going to end up in some kind of a facility with pretty bad disability. And I say this to you guys, emergency physicians, because it's not like you're going to be deciding who's going to get a craniectomy. But sometimes when you're in the emergency department, you're talking to the family and the family of this young man. And what do they want to know? 
They want to know, what are we doing? Is he going to survive? How is he going to do? Is he going to get better? And you're going to want to tell them something. You're going to want to be optimistic. You're going to want to be encouraging. And you may know that there's an option called craniectomy. But I would not bring that up with a family because once you tell the family, you know, don't worry. There's a surgery that we can do. It's called the craniectomy. They can take the skull off and um, patient can, the swelling can get better. Now they know that that's an option. And if the surgeons decide for whatever reason, and there are many good reasons not to do a craniectomy, they decide not to do it. Now the family has been set up and they think, well, we're not doing everything. And why aren't we doing everything? And it becomes a point of tension and great disappointment for the family. And I think this is a good general principle for any surgical patient, whether it's general surgery, neurosurgery, is we need to clarify with the surgeons that they are willing to offer the surgery before we tell the family about it. Because we're not doing the surgery and there may be, may be many good reasons not to do a craniectomy or, or any surgery. And we want to be consistent with the message that we bring to the family. So I told you that guy did really well. He did. He was young, fortunately. My message to you with TBI is, number one, remember you're using clinical judgment. You're using your intuition. And when you see that person roll through the door with a GCS of six who got hit on the head with a tree, start thinking about TBI, start thinking about the cerebral perfusion pressure that the brain is trying to maintain and the way that you can help it is by keeping the blood pressure up. Oxygenation is also, is also very important, but blood pressure is the most important. And the last message that I want to leave you with here is don't prognosticate early, especially with young people. We know from good literature that any brain injured patient, any neuro disaster, again, subarachnoid, um, acute ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, TBI, we are not good at prognosticating in the first 24 hours. We're very bad at it. Even neurosurgeons, neurointensivists, et cetera, we don't prognosticate. We say, we really don't know. We need to give this 24 hours to see where it's going to pan out. And right now we're going to do everything we can to improve the outcome and, and to help this young patient. So resist the urge to prognosticate either in, a, in an optimistic way or a pessimistic way. And don't offer any surgeries unless you're the one who's doing the surgery. So with that, um, I'm gonna stop and see if there are any questions. All right, thank you so much, Evie. That was enlightening in many different ways. I'm gonna start with a question from EMS. And they ask, does ramping the TBI patient decrease the ICT? And there's kind of a follow-up is in the pre-hospital environment, there historically has been so much pressure regarding spinal motion restriction and spinal stabilization. Um, how do you kind of advise EMS colleagues in regards to the management of a patient who has an isolated head injury and we're suspecting TBI? Great questions. And as far as ramping, that does not increase TBI. What it actually does is it helps the patient because you're doing the same thing as we're doing in the ED. We're putting the head of the bed up and 30 to 45 degree will help. There, there, are, there are actually studies that, that have looked at this and they've looked at how much does the blood flow egress from the jugular veins. And when you put the head of the bed up, it actually helps patients um, egress that blood. And when the blood comes out of the brain, you're actually buying yourself some space. So ramping is good. You wanna do whatever you can to get that TBI patient's head of bed up. And sometimes we're worried about spine, so we don't wanna just put the head of the bed up. And if you put somebody into reverse Trendelenburg, you can affect the same thing of getting the head of bed up. Just think of 
allowing blood flow to come out of the jugular system. Um, and as far as spinal motion restriction, I'm glad that you asked that question. Um, with, with traumatic brain injury, the uh, guidelines from EAST say that if you have a TBI, you need to be worried about the C-spine as well. And now, we, you know, we used to get, we used to get X of the C-spine to clear it, but nowadays we get a CT of the brain and a CT of the C-spine, and that's how we clear the C-spine. However, with this patient in the ED, you're not clearing that C-spine with just a CT because he's not awake enough to tell you if he has any pain. He's, you can only see with the CT that he's got no bony injury. We still don't know about the ligaments. And many patients who have trauma to the brain will have ligamentous injury. And that wins them. If you get an MRI, you will see ligamentous injury if you do it in the first 48 hours because that's where the fluid attenuation is gonna be evident. After 48 hours, you don't see fluid attenuation in the MRI and you don't know if there's ligamentous injury. So we like to MRI these, these uh, C-spines early on so that we can say there's no ligamentous injury and they don't need the collar. But if they have ligamentous injury, they win that collar for about six weeks. And that's a problem in the ICU because it causes skin breakdown. And I've got a patient in the ICU right now who has a tracheostomy and the skin breakdown is so bad from the, the pressure of the C collar that it's a wide gaping hole and it's, it makes me very anxious. Um, but in any case, I'm digressing. Um, with spinal motion restriction, um, you, you definitely want to use spinal motion restriction and be careful about that C-spine because depending, you know, we, we used to strap patients to the board. We couldn't get our, our EMT license if we didn't know how to solidly weld the patient to the board. And ironically, we used to start by uh, isolating the head first, which was very dangerous as we later learned because then you've got the big old body that's, um, you know, that, that, that can cause pressure on the C-spine. But um, using spinal motion restriction, being careful of the C-spine, and then maybe putting something under the board or under that patient or reverse T-berg with your stretcher as you can to keep their head of bed up. I'm not sure if I answered the uh, spinal motion restriction question that was asked. I think that was brilliant. I think, you know, your focus on the T collar, we're not strapping uh, folks down to the board, which sounds brilliant. We're using the cot or the stretcher itself as our mobilization device. All right, and then let's take uh, questions from the room. Anybody? Steve Scully has a okay. question. Anybody else in the room? Okay, Dr. Midgley. I just want to make sure I heard properly. My training, ketamine was like terrible for intubating the patients with. Mm -hmm. The pendulum has not swung. So we're getting uh, Dr. Midgley is asking more on ketamine for an RSI agent. You know, the uh, the myth in itself of elevated ICP has been so ingrained in us, even though you're telling me that I'm correspondingly increasing my cerebral perfusion pressure, I'm so skeptical. How do I overcome this challenge? This is, a, this is a really good question. And the data that was used to, to suggest that ketamine would increase ICP, and I can send you this data, it's, it's really pretty cool. What they looked at was um, whether, when they used ketamine, they looked at whether or not um, the ICP increased. But, and, and in most cases, the ICP may have increased a little bit, but then when they further dug into the vitals and they put together, they reconstructed the CPP, they saw that the CPP went up, which is what you want. And so they showed that even if ICP stayed the same or went up a little bit, the CPP went up even higher and that's what you wanted. So I, if you go back to the if you go back to the formula of CPP equals MAP minus ICP, I don't really care if that ICP goes up a little bit as long as my mean arterial pressure is higher. And 
and, and it overcomes the ICP. What I really care about is CPP. And another way to think about it is if you look at the ASEP guidelines for pediatric um, sedation, procedural sedation for pediatrics, I think it was back in 2008, they approved ketamine to be used for pediatric uh, sedation. And you know we, we just started recognizing that ketamine actually is beneficial. Now, I, I, I need to say this again. If you're worried about a bleed in the belly, if, if you get your ultrasound out and the fast is positive, um, I'm not using ketamine because I don't want to push that bleed. You know, with a bleed in the belly, we think that, you know, it could be tamponading itself off or it could have formed some clot. And if we push that hydrostatic pressure too much, we can pop that clot. And they showed this in pre-hospital studies from Texas um, years ago that if you keep, you know, you give fluid so that you keep that blood pressure high, those patients did worse. And presumably it's because of pushing the bleed. So, it's, so we have to be very careful when we say ketamine's a good agent for TBI. It's got to be isolated TBI. And you need to be fairly confident that there's no blood in the belly, the chest, or uh, pelvis, especially pelvis, because you, you don't want to increase that bleed.